American singer-songwriter Sufjan Stevens has a word for us today on the subject of widows. If you don't know who that is, talk to me after the service. You can thank me later. <laughs> this word comes from a song appropriately titled For the Widows in Paradise, For the Fatherless in Ypsilanti. When Sufjan performs the song live, he tends to introduce it like this. Let me do a song about a small town in Michigan called Paradise. I noticed when I went up there to play a football tournament in high school that there were all these single mothers and women and grandmothers, but there weren't any men. And so I had sort of devised a story in my mind that they had all died in a war and that they were all widows. But they were really a very happy and optimistic community and they all seemed to be working together, and it was like, women of the world, take over. The image of the war widow is familiar to us today. Documentarians and fiction writers alike lift up the stories of war widows as stories of unbreakable resolve on one hand, and stark reminders of the high cost of conflict on the other. Some of the widows in these stories band together to pursue an end to the conflict at hand, either through supporting the war effort or publicly demanding its swift end. Others struggle to go on with their lives as they deal with the most egregious loss of their love, their support, or in some cases, their livelihood. It's this image of the widow that we encounter in Scripture today. In our reading from 1 Kings, we saw Elijah in need of sustenance from a widow that we are told was herself close to death, caught in the middle of a conflict between her king and her God. And in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus draws our attention to widows not once, but twice. First, we see Jesus denounce the Jerusalem temple authorities as devourers of widows' houses. This invective comes at the end of a series of arguments that begins with Jesus walking in the temple to worship and to teach, and finds him set upon by authorities of all stripes, each trying to trap him in matters of legal or religious dogma. Having finally had enough, and perhaps having drawn a sufficient crowd, Jesus lays down the final word in the discourse. We can imagine Jesus looking pointedly over the crowd that's gathered around him, perhaps even going so far as to make eye contact with the temple employees who thought that this might be a good day and a good time to come after him. And he warns the crowd to beware of those who affect entitlement and opulence and demand to be greeted with the highest honor, for their affect comes at a price, a price that is paid by the most vulnerable among them. Then the scene abruptly shifts to an image of what we may describe as holy chaos, we are told that a crowd has gathered to put their money into the temple treasury, and that this crowd is largely made up of rich people who have come to deposit large sums. No pews, organ music, orderly lines, or baskets here. Just a hustle and bustle as each individual pushes their way toward the offering boxes, some perhaps even flanked by servants who may be singing the praises of their generous masters. And out of this crowd, Jesus spots a person that is described to us as a poor widow. We don't know much about this person apart from that description. First, we're told that she's poor. In the Greek, tokas, bent over, in the manner of a beggar. And we also know that she's a widow, in the Greek, hera, that which is lacking or bereft, but also is similar to a word that means barren or sterile. 
a person of this description existed on the margins of Jewish society. Although temple laws existed that guaranteed her a place in her late husband's household, it is likely that she had very little to do outside of the house. Women, particularly childless women, were forbidden from labor of any kind. And so it's likely that the two coins that she possessed, which were told were worth the equivalent of a penny and all that she had to live on, came from an allowance given to her by her husband's household, which, in turn, was likely drawn from the very treasury in which she now sought to deposit them. We can imagine in the midst of the crowd, this woman bent over, two coins in hand, at the margins of a throng eager to prove its righteousness, just trying to find a way in. And as Jesus sits down opposite the treasury, tired from an afternoon of teaching and arguing, he spots her on the edge of the crowd, and he is moved. He is moved so that he calls not a crowd, but his closest followers over to him, and he instructs them, Amen! Truly, I say to you, this person has put in more than all of those who cast in what they can out of their abundance. This person, for whom the treasury is intended to benefit, and who sees fit to return to it, from the meager allowance that she had to live on. This, Jesus tells his disciples, is what service looks like. We don't know if this person was widowed by war, or sickness, or age. But the image of the war widow is one that would have been familiar to the author of the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark bears two distinctions worth mentioning in conjunctions with this passage. First, it is the oldest complete narrative of the Synoptic Gospels. And second, it was written during a time of war. Nearly 40 years after the young church had begun to proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus, Revolutionary forces in Galilee sought to restore the kingdom of Israel by force, by driving out the empire that had oppressed them for so long. Before this time, Mark's gospel had been a story repeated by word of mouth, telling of the coming of God in the midst of cataclysm. By the time it was written down, the temple had been destroyed, and the cataclysm had already come. In the midst of loss and the need to rebuild, Mark turns to the words of Jesus to guide the fledgling church forward into the new world. And the direction to which Jesus points turns away from old established authority and instead points outward to those living on the margins of society as the harbingers of a new way of living. One hundred years ago today, the church and the secular world alike faced a similar choice. When an armistice finally brought an end to the war that was to end all wars. This is a phrase with which we are no doubt familiar, an attempt to qualify an event that defied description. But for the church, the war to end all wars carried a meaning that was apocalyptic in its intensity. Men in long robes stood in pulpits like this one and urged the men of their congregation to charge first into the conflict that would bring God's liberty to the world. They promised them respect and love in the marketplaces and places of honor in the heavenly banquet. And all the while, more wives became widows, their houses devoured. But these widows would not remain bent over on the margins of society. 
they would push through the crowds and give out of their livelihood so that no one in need should be in want. They would form organizations that crossed national boundaries dedicated to social relief, human equality, and pacifism. They turned their suffering into a drive that would see to it that no one would have to suffer as they did. They fought for their right to representation in government so that their voice could be heard. And although not all voices were represented in their fight, they created a path from the margins that others would follow. We have seen the fruit of this labor all over the nation this week, as an unprecedented number of women of marginalized identity have taken their place to help reshape our world. Some of these women have been bent over by abuse at the hands of the government which they now serve. Some have been bent over by suspicion and hate due to their genuine expressions of faith. Still others have been bent over by a society that chooses to deny them their identity. And some, like the widow in the temple, have been bent over by the weight of debt, so that they struggle to even find a place to live. But Jesus points to these women, pushing at the margins to offer their livelihood for the betterment of all, and says, Amen! I say to you, these have given more than all the rich who have given from their abundance. And we, who struggle here in this place, can look on these examples as Jesus' disciples looked on in the temple, and recognize in them the faith active in love to which Jesus directs us. The love testified to in our reading from Hebrews, the love which sacrifices itself for the good of all. And if we want an affirmation of what that love sounds like, I suggest listening to the chorus of the song for the widows in paradise, for the fatherless in Ypsilanti. If there's anything to say, if there's anything to do, if there's any other way, I'll do anything 